One of the titles I've selected for this text is Breakfast on the Beach. It is interesting to me as you look at this text that Jesus goes to the trouble of serving a meal. In fact, if you remember, Jesus said elsewhere, who is greater, the one who is served the meal or the one serving the meal? And yet he says, I have come serving you the meal. And I think about the meals that Jesus has served, it reminds me of the Passover in Luke chapter 22. There was a meal there as well, and I think it serves as the backdrop for our text. It's at that meal that the Passover is observed. It's also at that meal that Jesus tells his disciples that one of them will betray him. <laughs> and it's at that meal that the disciples then begin to argue as to who of them is the greatest of all. And you remember, it's at that point, too, that Jesus tells Peter that he will deny him three times. And Peter affirms to the Lord that he is the one who most certainly will remain faithful to Jesus. And so as I see them eating this breakfast on the beach, it seems to me that that meal is a kind of setting. And again, it may bring memories back to Peter and the others, and certainly to us, about what it is that Jesus is about to do. And that leads us to the conversation that takes place in verses 15 through 17, a, a conversation that you and I know very well. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. He said to them the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Who of us doesn't know this story well? Obviously, the three repetitions of, do you love me, uh, take us back to the three denials of Peter, that he even knows the Lord Jesus. And three times when Jesus asks Peter if he loves him, and Peter says, yes, I do. The Lord Jesus then says, you need to shepherd my sheep. Care for your master's flock. Now, it's interesting when you look at this text, and many have made much of the fact that different words are used for love. And some have chosen to make a great deal of that. I'm not so sure in my mind that that's necessarily the case. John tends to change his terms just for variety, and maybe that's all there is. But I do want to make a couple of other observations that I think are significant for our consideration, and I want to talk about some implications. Notice that we moved from the fishing story, catching fish, to tending sheep. The imagery of a fisherman, now the imagery of a shepherd. And I would like to suggest to you that that's a commentary on what it means to make disciples. If you're going to make disciples, the first thing you have to do is lead people to faith in Jesus Christ. And that's evangelism. So that's catching fish. Now we've moved from catching fish to tending sheep. And that's a part of discipleship as well. It isn't enough just to introduce people to the Lord Jesus as Savior. They need to be nurtured and brought along to maturity in their faith in Jesus Christ. So discipleship involves both evangelism and nurturing. And I think that's evident in this text. Notice that he uses different terms for sheep. The first time he says to feed my sheep, he actually says, feed my lambs. And I understand in that that he's talking, he's differentiating between different kinds of sheep. Some sheep are lambs, they're just baby Christians, and they need to be brought along from where they are. And there are others who are more mature in their faith. They're sheep, adult sheep, and they're to be brought along as well. So that shepherding the flock means shepherding the entire flock, and that includes a breadth of maturity 
uh, that needs to be taken into account. So there's different kinds of sheep. There's different kinds of shepherding here. One of them is the word that means to feed. And you surely shepherd uh, sheep by seeing to it that they are fed. Psalm 23 talks about the Lord as the good shepherd leading his sheep to green pastures. And that, of course, is true. But there's another term that's employed here that has more of a general sense of tending for the sheep, of caring for them. And I think that's the broader work of the shepherd. The shepherd is to protect his sheep from dangers. The shepherd is to guide his sheep uh, as to where they should go. And I believe that that's encompassed. All kinds of sheep and the full spectrum of shepherding that is meant to take place. Uh, I would simply uh, make a comment at this point, and that is this. That's the kind of work that is bigger than any one person. In my mind today, discipleship tends to be very much focused on one person, on one other person. And I'm not in any way negating the importance of one-to-one -one interaction. But what I'm saying is that what Jesus is saying needs to take place here is more than a one-man job. It takes a broader spectrum, I think, of gifts and ministry to accomplish that. So I believe that what he's saying here is that shepherding the flock is the work of an elder. I had to check my text just a moment ago to look at 1 Peter chapter 5. But when Peter speaks of himself, he speaks of himself as a fellow elder. And he addresses elders and he tells them to care for the flock. In other words, what Jesus is telling Peter to do here is really to do the work of an elder. And Peter is saying to elders, this is the work which they need to carry on as well, just as he has been commissioned by the Lord Jesus. This is the work of the church. Disciple making is the work of the church. Disciple making is under the purview and the guidance and the leadership of the elders. That doesn't mean that the elders do all of the work. It means they assume the responsibility for leading and guiding in that shepherding process. <laughs> Probably don't have to say this, but I will. He also, the Lord Jesus also reminds Peter that the sheep are his. He says, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. And we need to remember the flock is the flock of our Lord. It is the church of our Lord. It is not ours. It is not our possession. It may be ours in the sense of a ministry focus, but it belongs to him. We care for his sheep because we love him. Notice the emphasis on love. Three times the question is asked, do you love me? And three times essentially the same answer is given. If you love me, then you will care for that which I love. You will care for my sheep. You will tend for them. You will be a shepherd to them. We love what the one we love loves. And that is the sheep. And so we are to love him. And the way we are to love him is by caring for the sheep for which he has given his blood. And he is redeemed by his great sacrifice. Those are our notes of emphasis, once again, that we find in Peter's epistle, uh, in first Peter it's love for the Lord then it's love for his flock that he's talking about here's one more thing that isn't exactly a comforting thought to Peter but Jesus says to him in verses 18 and 19 when you were younger you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished when you grow old you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go now this, he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. Peter's obedience is going to lead to death. If Peter walks in our Lord Jesus' steps, he's literally going to walk in those steps in the sense that he is going to be called upon to give up his life for the sheep, for the flock. And that, I think, is very clear. And it's clear as well that in so doing, Peter is going to glorify the Lord Jesus. His death will bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's another thing that I think may be important to note here. The emphasis, uh, the emphasis of this text is on love. Do you love me, he says, three times. 
When Jesus was speaking to the disciples before in Luke chapter 5, he said, do not fear any longer. And I would suggest to you that as the disciples look ahead to their future, as they think about what lies ahead, and they know that there's some uncertainty and certainly danger, here they are hiding out behind locked doors for fear that they're going to be arrested. Even knowing all of that danger, what does Jesus do to bring them comfort and joy? He emphasizes love. And I couldn't help but think about those words from the Apostle John when he says, love casts out fear. The way to deal with fear in our lives, fear even for the reality of martyrdom, is our love for the Lord Jesus. That casts out fear. These may sound like strange and foreign words to us, but there are believers today who take them very literally. It may well be this very day that some who shepherd the flock of God will pay for it with their own blood. Shepherd the flock even to the loss of life. And the last thing I would say is this. In the end, Jesus says to Peter, follow me. Ultimately, the leader of the church of our Lord Jesus Christ, or the leaders of the church, are ultimately followers of Jesus. Leaders are followers, followers of Jesus. And that's why Paul says, follow me as I follow him. We lead by following Jesus. And that may even lead to death. It certainly leads to caring for his sheep.